and you know the rest of my family. Yeah, amen, amen. So today, I had a chance to share a little bit about our work in Japan, uh, in, in Asia, uh, over at the barn, um, and it was lovely, uh, but that time is done. So we're going to dig into God's word. John chapter 6, verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your grace, your goodness, and your mercy. And Lord, we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, the bread that came down from heaven. Lord, you are everything that we need. You are our hope. You are our strength in difficult times. And Lord, you are our friend who sticks closer than a brother. Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand and receive your word today. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Jews complained, grumbled about Jesus. And really, that, that's difficult. Because who would complain about Jesus? He's nice, right? He's sweet. He always says good things. He helps people. He does miracles. He's compassionate. He's gentle. Why complain about Jesus? It's kind of like complaining about Mr. Rogers. (laughs) I watched the movie last night. It was good. Go see it. Why complain? He's a nice guy. Well, they complained for a very specific reason. Verse 35, uh, verse 41, sorry. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They thought, well, we know Joseph. We know Joseph's parents. We know where you came from. I feel a little bit of that today. Who are you? You see, they're not complaining because Jesus is a nice guy. They're not complaining because he's compassionate or he helps people or he does miracles. They're complaining because Jesus claims to be from heaven. They're complaining because Jesus... His claim to be from heaven means there's a God who made you. And that God cares about what you do with your life. That God has a claim on your life. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. So you can't just do what you want to do. You're not free to ignore him. And so people complain. Verse 43, Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me Unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. I would say that there are three ways that people approach Jesus. Three ways. The first way is tradition. Tradition means I'm coming to Jesus because that's what we do. We're Christians. We've been Christians for generations. My parents came here, and now I come here. 
and especially we come here at Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving midweek. That was new. And that's frankly why I'm here. I came to visit my parents for Thanksgiving. So tradition. And tradition is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Tradition means we have something stable, something solid that we know. It's firm. It doesn't change in a very chaotic world. There are promises of Scripture. There's the hope that we just lit this candle about. That's good. Tradition. That's number one. The second way that people approach Jesus Christ is when they're in trouble, when they need a miracle, when they're desperate and they're crying out, Lord, help me. And our God is gracious. He's good. And he meets people in their time of need and he doesn't hold anything against them. There's no grudge. He's not saying, well, you didn't come to me last time. Or actually, you did come to me last time, but then what did you do? No. God is good. And he meets us with miracles. Answers to prayer. He comes around us and encourages us. And supports us. So people come to Jesus through tradition. And they come to Jesus looking for miracles. But there's a third way that people come to Jesus. Jesus says, it is written in the prophets, verse 45... And they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. So this third way, the Father draws them to me. And they are taught by God. This third way is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's different than tradition. And it's different than looking for a miracle. This third way means that I want to be with Jesus. And I need Jesus in my life. I need him waking up. I need him going to bed. I need him all through the day because there's stuff happening. I need to ask God, what should I do? Give me wisdom. I need sometimes comfort. Hard stuff happens. I need a relationship where I'm drawn to Jesus and God teaches me. Now, there's nothing wrong with tradition. God uses it. It helps us. Sometimes we have a hard time hearing from God. We feel far away from God. We don't get immediate answers. And during those times, tradition is really helpful. We don't forget who we are, why we're here, what's come before, the hope that he's given to us. But tradition is not the whole thing. That's not all there is. There's more to it. The miracles. Praise God for the miracles. Praise God that... People do get healed. Praise God that help does come through. But folks, 
the miracles also are not everything, are they? Jesus wants us to be drawn close to him, to have a relationship with him, that he would be the bread of life. Let's look at that next verse. Verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This bread of life, it's different than the manna. It's different than the miracles. It's different than feeding the 5,000. We're hungry. God does miracles. Jesus does feed the 5,000. But he's talking about something more. The bread of life. We uh, started a feeding ministry uh, back in, whoa, 2008. It's been a while. And at that time, we had a, a gentleman in our church who was managing Costco. Costco had just come to Japan. Praise the Lord. And... <laughs> You don't understand that unless you've lived overseas where there's no turkey, there's no baking goods, there's, right? And Costco arrives and, oh, turkey, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Tradition. We started a feeding ministry and we would get baked goods from Costco and we would receive them three times a week. And so we went first time to pick these up and we went with our van and they filled the entire van with pound cake 70 boxes each box has three pound cakes right 70 boxes of pound cake praise the lord we're like wow this is great uh, we also received the food right it's for the poor yeah you got it right so we gave it out to everybody we could think of. We, you know, gave as many of these pound cakes away as we could. We still have boxes and boxes of pound cake. And the next time we go, we drive up to Costco. We're thinking, oh, I wonder what we're going to get today. And we got 70 boxes of pound cake. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. More pound cake. Okay, and so we came home and we thought, how in the world are we going to get rid of this pound cake? Japanese people don't actually eat much pound cake anyway, and we'd given them the three pound cakes in each box. That's enough for a month, right? And we're there, you know, and hey, would you like some more pound cake? And they're like, ah, that stuff's pretty dense, right? So we found orphanages, and we found all kinds of places to give the pound cake away. And we went back to the third time, pulled up in our van. We filled the van again with pound cake, yes. So we had pound cake for the third time in a row. And we said, oh my gosh, more pound cake. That's manna. That's manna, right? The first time, oh, thank you, Lord, for the manna. Second time, oh, more manna. Third time, oh, my gosh, you got to eat manna again? <laughs> Costco muffins. I will never eat another one in my life. <laughs> Just saying. They're good, but I've had too many of them. Miracles don't guarantee thankfulness, right? 
You get something for free. It's grace. That doesn't mean that you appreciate it. It doesn't mean that you thank God for it. It doesn't mean that you automatically now have a relationship with the Father, does it? Miracles are simply signposts that are supposed to show us the way, but they don't dictate where we have to go, do they? And so we come to God in, in an emergency. Lord, please. And God's gracious. God is good. But does that always turn someone's heart to Jesus? Actually, no. It doesn't. Jesus is the bread of life. It's not just manna, where you eat once and you die, or eat again and again and again and you die. It's not just tradition. This is what our fathers taught us, and this is what we're going to keep. He is the bread that comes down from heaven. You guys probably were in John chapter 4 a little while ago, right? Are you going chapter by chapter? That's good. I like that. Chapter 4 was the woman at the well. And she comes to draw water and has a little talk with Jesus. And Jesus says, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for water. And I would give you living water. And you wouldn't be thirsty anymore. Jesus here says, I'm the bread of life. Not just manna. I'm going to give you something else. Something more important. Let me read that section here in verse 52. The Jews then disputed amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Jesus here tells them this truth in the most in-your-face way possible. Okay? He says, you are going to become cannibals and vampires. You're going to eat me and drink my blood. And they're like, no way. Jesus chooses these words carefully. He does this on purpose because he does not want them to make a mistake. This is a mistake that many Christians make. We want to be careful about it. What Jesus is saying here This is not the manna. This is not another tradition. This isn't business as usual. We're going to do something different. Now, I hope you get the irony that I'm standing right behind the communion table right now. This isn't manna. It's not a miracle providing for your needs today because you're in trouble. It's not tradition. The thing that you believe because you believe it. Because that's what you've always known. This is something different. 
He says, you have no life unless you eat my flesh. Now, what does he mean? What are we talking about? Verse 56. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. It's a connection, okay? A relationship between me, a sinner, and Almighty God through Jesus Christ, his Son. That connection stays. It remains. It continues. The miracle, the manna, doesn't stay. It melts away. You forget about it. Sometimes you're not even thankful for it. And then the next time you're in trouble, oh Lord. And God, I mean, I shake my head at it. How are you so gracious, God? They didn't listen to you last time. They definitely didn't listen to me. And yet, you're so good. That doesn't last. What Jesus wants is a relationship. Now he says bread. Because how often do we eat? First breakfast? Second breakfast? I'm always amazed at how much Americans eat. <laughs> I'm coming back from Japan, and the portions are bigger, and you eat more often. It's constant, and I love it, but I must go back home. <laughs> but that's what Jesus wants from you. He wants to have breakfast with you. He wants to have lunch with you. He wants to have dinner with you. He wants to have an afternoon snack and some ice cream before you go to bed, okay? He, and I'm not just talking about grace here, okay? You don't have to say grace before you have the ice cream. I'm talking about just a constant relationship with Jesus. Where I wake up in the morning and I'm like, Lord, what do you have for me today? And prepare my heart for it. Help me to be gracious. Help me to be loving. Help me to be faithful to the calling that you've given to me. And then as I go through the day, as I'm in a difficult meeting, or I'm dealing with a difficult child, or I'm struggling, I say, Lord, give me patience. Help me to approach this the way that you would. And you go through your whole day like this. That's abiding. So it's not just Sunday coming to keep the tradition. Now some of you, it's after all, it's the week after Thanksgiving, right? So some of you might be here because tradition, because you love your family. And you honor them by being here in this room. That's great. That's awesome. Thank you for doing that. Honor your father and your mother. It's the first commandment with a promise, right? That it may be well with you. Good stuff. Some of you might be here because, seriously, you're in trouble. You're desperate. You don't know where else to go. And you're crying out, Lord, help me. That's okay. God's good and he will help you. But what God really wants is that relationship that happens all the time. Now, sometimes we're praying and it seems like it's not going through. And we seem far away from God. And it's hard.